know, despite how close I am to the camera, this is not a makeup tutorial. I have not changed the purpose of this uh, website just yet. Um, the reason why you see me in this uh, situation in a completely different setting from where I normally would be talking to you is because I recently had a small accident. I broke my leg uh, skateboarding because I'm a terrible skateboarder. And uh, because of that, I don't really have access to the room, which is at the top of uh, three flights of stairs where I would normally record everything and where the audio on the video would be considerably better. So uh, this is what we're going to be dealing with for probably the next 30 days. Uh, apologies for not having created anything for the last month uh, since uh, the very popular Devin Townsend interview that we published about a month ago, but other things had to take priority uh, in this case. Today I'm going to show you an interview that I did a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a week ago, uh, with uh, Emma of Garmarna. This is a Swedish band that is just released a new album under Season of Mist, and which is mostly a folk band, a Scandinavian folk band, uh, of the likes of Skald or uh, Heilung or uh, Vartruna. Now, their sources are, however, more recent than something like Heilung. They mostly focus on medieval Scandinavian ballads, and it is actually very interesting because they continue this tradition of folk music, of constantly reinventing the way in which these oral traditions continue to pass uh, through history. I think that you're going to find it very interesting because we don't, even if you don't know the band, we don't only discuss the band uh, Gar Marna, but also discuss folk music in general and a little bit of history as well as some tips on what to do if you ever find a corpse next to a lake. I'm really certain that you're going to enjoy it and I look forward to seeing you all again very soon once I can uh, walk and skateboard again or maybe breaks a different bone. Take care, stay metal. The first obvious question for 2020 is, uh, how are you doing? Uh, I mean, just in general, things are slightly more uh, chaotic uh, this time around. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very strange uh, to be a musician. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I am fine, my family is fine. Uh, we are surviving. <laughs> uh, we, I've been able to do some small concerts in the fall for with, with an audience of 50 people, um, which is, uh, well, a life uh, yeah. uh, upholding thing, <laughs> which is good. Uh, so, I mean, it's a very strange year. And I suppose that next year will be strange as well. One of the things that rarely ends up being discussed, right? Because we all discuss the, the health situation, but the situation, of course, of the entertainment industry, and that includes not just bands, but roadies and catering and all of that is, is currently uh, stopped. So I wasn't sure what was the, the situation in Sweden right now. So the, the concerts are still allowed, but with very small crowds or? With, yeah, with 50 persons in the audience is allowed. Mm -hmm. And no one dared to do them in the beginning of the year, of course. I, I'm, from March to July, there was nothing. But then in August, some, some uh, organizers uh, started to dare to have 50 people in the audience and do co small concerts. So that's good, I think. Now they made some kind of decision that it can be, I think... Uh, was it 300 in the audience or was it 150? I don't remember if there can be enough space around them. Right. And, but I don't know. I, don't, I, I doubt that will start to happen uh, yet. But even if it did, I think that the, the problem, and I am in no way trying to, don't worry, I'm not trying to like get you to, to judge Sweden's response or anything uh, like that. It's mostly that as a musician, of course, it is questionable how, how, profitable can be for anybody to actually tour if you're only able to play in front of uh, 50 people. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. It has to be then, if, if it's only 50 people, then uh, the, the organizer needs to have a support from somewhere else mm -hmm. because they cannot get what the artists want in, with 50 people in the audience. Mm -hmm. So everyone is depending now on, uh, on uh, grants yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's that's a problem. Emma, let's go back to 1990, so a good 30 years ago, uh, which is a, a fantastic uh, career, uh, when Garmarna 
started, if I'm not mistaken, it was at a violin camp where you met the rest uh, of the band. Can you walk me a little bit about the around the beginnings of, of the band? Yeah, we met. So we 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 met at the violin camp uh, where where we were learning Swedish folk music, uh, and I was there because my father was on a, one of the teachers. Uh, so I, me and my brother went there with him to to learn some tunes and be a part of that camp. And uh, Stefan and uh, Gotte, the Hördegörde player and uh, violin and guitar. Uh, they were also there, so we we started to get to know each other, and uh, well, we made music and had fun. And uh, they they started the the Garmana band as a trio first with an, uh, with Rickard, who's the second guitarist and bass player. Uh, and then because of uh, when when they were going to record the, their first little EP, ninety two, then they asked me if I wanted to join as a guest singer because they were like an instrumental trio at, at first. Uh, and since we knew each other from the, from the violin camps, they asked me because I, I sang as well. And uh, I thought I was a guest singer. Uh, and uh, then we made an interview with uh, the local paper and they asked who's in the band. And the guy said, well, it's Emma and it's, uh, and I was like, I, I'm I'm just a guest singer, and they say, "Oh no, you're in the band." <laughs> so that's how it started. And, and you mentioned this violin camp to go learn classic uh, or rather folk Swedish tunes. Uh, you'll have to pardon my ignorance in this regard, but I am I'm sure that I speak for a lot of non-Swedish people. So, is this type of activity still popular? Is folk music a, a still a rather large draw for for younger generations? It's like an underground scene. If you know where to find it, then you can find uh, good uh, uh, classes and, uh, and uh, camps for young people to go and play and learn and sing and dance. And, and, uh, but it's not, I wouldn't say that everyone in Sweden knows about this <laughs> since it's an underground scene more or less, but it's quite a big underground scene. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of people working with it and doing it and uh, going to the, like the folk music festivals and stuff. But, but uh, it's not maybe if you ask anyone on the street, they might not know about it, but depends on who you ask. <laughs> There are two two things about folk music that, that I find interesting. On the one hand, there is the, the musical aspect of it. I remember when I first discovered the hurdy-gurdy, not that I play it by any stretch of the imagination, I struggle with a guitar. So it's I, I can imagine a hurdy-gurdy would, would result in injuries. Um, but I discovered it with this um, a Swiss band, El Uete, who who kind of mix heavy metal with, with uh, Gaelic, uh, Gaulish music. And, and I kind of started to get into it, and it was quite fascinating to see the history behind some of the music. But at the same time, it was interesting to see how for many musicians, there was this call to preserve their, their history, not in, a, not in a kind of cultural war kind of situation, but rather in response to what appears to be perhaps a certain homogenization of culture that is largely influenced by American music because they happen to be kind of this, this, this very influential cultural force so that a lot of people want to come back against that with music that represents their history and their culture, as in your case with Sweden. There are bands like, although they mix it a little bit with, with heavy metal, The Who uh, in, in, in Mongolia that kind of try to get Mongolian folk music out. What was in folk music and kind of modernizing folk music that attracted you? Was it just the musical aspect of it? Or was it also the historical and perhaps archaeological aspect of, of the music? Well, for, for me personally, uh, I, I, I grew up in a family who's been playing the fiddle for four gener generations, mm. uh, folk music, and, uh, and we've been singing as well. So I had it from from scratch uh, so for me it has been a part of my life always uh, and uh, like 
a culture and a history and uh, something that I was brought up with. Uh, so for me, it was very close to start to, to do it. It was something that we do in my family. <laughs> Everyone does it. <laughs> uh, uh, but I think uh, for the guys from the, the Garmana guys, they came in, Stefan, who's playing the Hurdigurdian violin, he also had it from his father. Uh, and But he was also very into electronical music in the mm -hmm. 80s. Like that was what what he was really listening to, and uh, and when he started to make music on his own, it was like a natural thing to blend the mm -hmm. folk music that he had on one side with the music that he was listening to. Uh, and I know that when they had started the instrumental trio of uh, Garmana, they went to see a theater uh, that was called it was Amledo. Uh, and it was a theater where they had used a lot of folk music uh, in the in the theater like it was a mix of folk music and uh, theater and it was very good and they were really like wow we have to do something like this as well uh, so they started Garmana and they started to to do what they could <laughs> with the, with the instrument they had and uh, and it was like the folk the folk music that was the uh, the seed. Um, yeah, I understand kind of what the thing that kind of glued yeah. everything together. Yeah, and that the, the thing that uh, everything was built around. Mm -hmm. uh, so when they asked me to join and, and to, like to sing uh, a medieval ballad on that first EP, uh, we were, for me, it was a medieval ballad, but maybe for them it was just or for some in the, in the band, it was a tune that was good that right. we could build up with anything. And it wasn't uh, important to use, it wasn't important to try to be traditional folk. Mm -hmm. uh, it was important to play music that uh, that we liked. And for example, Jens, the drummer, who also came in in the band in 92, uh, he came from the rock scene and had never been listening to folk music before. So I think I think I think everyone brought an element into the music that they were used to and they were listening to, and that's what's created our sound. Uh, you mentioned your growing up with a family of musicians, and I was reading an interview that you did, I think, almost thirty years ago, actually, when you were <laughs> discussing, uh, where you were discussing how growing up with this family of musicians you thought, well, everybody learn, everybody grows up with music and this type of music, and then suddenly you realize, actually, they don't. Actually, yeah. I am very special growing up, surrounded by music like this. So can you tell me a little bit about how that was? L not just the realization, but rather living a life that is uh, shaped by music like that in your childhood, growing up with that appreciation of music. Well, it's just very, uh, it's very natural. I mean, you don't think of it as something that is special when you grow up with it because it's just yeah everybody is singing everybody's playing and i thought everyone any grown-up would play the fiddle <laughs> right every every swedish family has a, yeah, a fiddle I thought, so. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so i think i was 10 when i realized that everyone's mother and father do not play the fiddle and uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so it was that. very natural, but uh, I mean, I'm now I'm so I'm very glad that I had that mm -hmm. thing to grow up with, and I'm glad when I see that my children enjoys being at the like the, the folk music festivals and stuff, and they feel they can feel the freedom that it is to be a musician's child. I think, <laughs> but it is also that I think it's not just that that, that you appreciate the music, but it's almost like you learn a different language growing up, right? So like you speak Swedish, but you also speak music. Like you understand music in a way that other people don't. Maybe, yeah, that's a good way of to look at it. In a way, yes, yeah, because I, I learned the Swedish folk music language <laughs> from childhood, that's true. Something that you didn't learn, as I saw in one of these 30 year old interviews though was reading sheet music, right? Yeah. Like you joined Garmana without actually being able to read uh, musical script. 
yes i'm still very bad at that actually that's uh, it, i have to say that surprises me i didn't know that violin playing was compatible with not being able to read sheet music like i didn't <laughs> know that that was a thing you could do it's i mean i, I could never play classical music of course because i don't it's I, a really I, different style certainly yeah yeah uh, and also classical music you need to be able to read <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but in in folk music you learn by ear you learn mm -hmm. from oh. a person to another person and uh, and you uh, also when i look for material for garmana or my other bands i go to the archives where they have uh, recorded old people singing uh in the 50s and 60s and maybe earlier as well on you know this old yeah like in gramophone records and stuff like that yeah. yeah or yeah they went out to it was a big uh, collect collection mm -hmm. made in the 50s 60s 70s 60s and 70s they went out to find old people and record them singing what they've heard their father and mother and grandmother sang so we have a big big uh, sounding archive that we can go to and find material in and that's how i do it to to find material but it's quite interesting as well right because the fact that you go into this archive and you and you find that there was this research 50 years ago trying to record this uh, people from previous Swedish generations playing this music shows that you are adding a new layer to that archive. Because one of the things that are so beautiful about traditional folk music, not just in Sweden, but also in America, for example, is how it transforms over time, precisely because it is this thing that originally was just passed by ear. Oh, you played that, I'll play it myself. And everybody was adding something new. Yeah. In one way, Garmana is, is just the new step in that. When, when somebody listens to, to the, 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 the ballads in, in your new album, all of which are traditional Scandinavian ballads, you're not really changing them as much as just doing exactly what folk musicians have been doing since the beginning of time, which is to reinvent them and to make them your own. Yeah, that's true. We and make in, them our own. Hmm. In 2016, uh, you, so, first of all, what, what led to this kind of 15-year hiatus that happened before your previous album, number number six? Uh, yeah, we uh, in one way it had already like started to uh, fade out a little bit. We didn't play as much uh, in the beginning of the 2000s as we had done in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And then I think also the the period of uh, people <laughs> getting children <laughs> and uh, getting married and uh, doing grown up grown up stuff like that. Uh, it was it made it uh, more. It made uh, Garmana rest in a way. It made uh, the band uh, take a break, uh, even though we never. We didn't say let's take a break or we didn't say let's not play any longer. It just it just happened and it was like a natural step for where we were in our lives. And also I think that we uh, many of the songs on this CD that we release now, we had already started to try to arrange or try to play uh, when we stopped for 15 years or what, what, whatever it was. Uh, and then we started to think about recording a new album and, and uh, what happened then what, was that it was the songs that uh, were released in 2016 that started to develop. And I was not uh, totally ready for doing new written material that felt very strange for me to walk uh, walk away from the from the traditional swedish folk singing and also because of that i think that we needed to have this long break because then when we started again when we decided to okay let's have a look at what we were trying to do there when we when we didn't continue 
uh, what happened then was that I could all of a sudden write lyrics to that new written music uh, that we'd been working with, but that we just uh, stopped uh, working with. And that is what happened, uh, that is what developed and uh, formed the CD, the, the album Six. But you say uh, that, that you were not completely ready for that type of new music and I would say there's an argument that neither were your fans in the sense that the reaction to the album was was rather mixed uh, and I, I yeah. think it is expected in the sense of if you really if you are if they are expecting traditional folk music this was a complete departure there were a, a different lyrical topics it wasn't just original music that dealt with folkloric topics why uh, I, I don't mean that I don't mean that in a judgmental way of like why did you do this but rather mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a significant change. Yeah, we had, uh, as I said, we had both, we had the traditional things as well that are now released on Förbundet. Uh, but we, tr we decided to put the traditional stuff on the side and to make two separate albums, uh, to make one that was the new written stuff, since we have th had that new written stuff and... Uh, mm it was developing and it, uh, and I think that Garamana, we have had a quite a long uh, uh, culture or whatever to call it uh, of uh, ex experimental because uh, we did that album the Hildegard von Bingen album as well that was really different and that was from the start a, a live tour that we did uh, uh, with her music in churches in in Sweden, uh, and it was uh, on a proposal from the from uh, the promoters of the region because they were going to celebrate the nine hundred years or something one thousand years maybe or I don't remember <laughs> since she was born or <laughs> yeah, since yeah, I don't yeah. think <laughs> it's so funny because I was reading this one of these old interviews and your your uh, comments about this uh, the author of this ballast was. I don't know, it is the anniversary when she died, or maybe when she was born. Something, <laughs> something happened to her. <laughs> Still not sure, but that's the thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's fine. Um, yeah, and that was also a very, uh, uh, um, a trip out to something to completely different, uh, that I also think that, as you said, with the album Six, that people were either very enthusiastic or very, uh, some people were actually very disappointed as well. Uh, because we went to, so far away from what we usually do and uh, so I think actually that the, maybe the the album six was some kind of step back from Hildegard von Bingen mm -hmm. uh, to be in the middle of Hildegard von Bingen and the old stuff that we were doing so we needed six as well to <laughs> to have the the in-between step and oh, now we're back it. Now we're back uh, to where we started, in a way, with the old folk uh, ballads, and uh, and uh, I, I actually this is my favorite album since uh, since uh, Via the Yelling in '99. Wow! I think the the album that we release now, the sixth of November, is uh, one of my absolute Garmana favorites, and. Uh, uh, not that I don't like the Hildegard von Bingen and the and six, but I am a folk singer, so this is more closer to my heart, uh, what we're doing now. How did you end up on Season of Mist? Because it is a heavy metal uh, uh, label, often black metal, quite uh, extreme metal, um, but at the same time, they picked up some kind of folk and folk metal bands recently. Heilung is one of them, uh, Skald from France, if I'm not mistaken, is with them. Um, because there is clearly an interest of people who kind of got into folk metal and then they retain the interest even after you remove the metal part. Yeah. How did you end up in this, uh, in this label? And when did you realize that there might be this cross-pollination of interest coming from something as, at first, different from the folk community as it is heavy metal? 
Yeah, I think we've always had like heavy metal listeners listening to our music. Uh, so that feels like a quite uh, natural step actually to 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 get a label that that has uh, other listeners than mm. folk music listeners uh, and espe especially the metal listeners I, th I think since we've had them in our audience for 30 years uh, uh, and I have to think now how we how the how come it was a season of mist I think maybe that Stefan the hurdy-gurdy player he had been working with uh, people from Heilung uh, and also they've been but that was later though but I think it was through the connection with Heilung that uh, they suggested that we should propose to Season of Mist and ask them if they were interested and they were. No clearly I mean I was I was very surprised the first time that I saw Heilung I think three years ago I saw them at health fest this festival in france and i had never heard of them but then when i saw them play here in the netherlands there is a lot of interest in this type of music that uh surprised me the amount of people dressed up in pelts and like skulls and things like yeah. that at a theater was relatively surprising i didn't know there were that much people interested in traditional scandinavian culture here but apparently there is <laughs> which is which is fun don't get me wrong um it is interesting, though, because there you, you, you see this extremely almost prehistoric folk music from, uh, from Heilung, whereas you, if I'm not mistaken, you kind of are more of a, like the music of, of, of uh, Garmarna seems less, uh, and you, of course I'm, I'm ignorant on the issue of Scandinavian culture, but it, it does seem to be more modern, that, like the ballads that you cover seem to be more modern than the kind of almost tribal music of something like Heilung. Uh, from a historical perspective, I mean, your sources would be more recent than those of, of Highland. Uh, with Garmana, we find the material, we know that it has been sung in the maybe uh, 16th century or earlier or later. Uh, we, we focus a lot on medieval ballads or uh, on this uh, last one, we also have like old uh, church singing songs that were sung in the 16th or 17th century mm -hmm. uh, and that has been uh, kind of that has continued being played in Sweden because you are even able to listen to it from recordings of 50 years ago yeah exactly it has been you know in an oral tradition as well it has been preserved I think that that was yeah. the world over yeah preserved yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we know our sources. I, I would guess that Heilung is playing music that is supposed to be so old, so there are no really so sources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, have to, they have to think. It might have, this might have been what it could have been in, that, in those days. Uh, that's my guess. I don't know. No, certainly. Uh, no, but I know that uh, uh, Maria, the singer, she mm -hmm. is also singing... Uh, the same kind of style of music that I do in I've heard her do that in other projects uh, so I guess they are doing some kind of mix between what they know people has been singing and what they assume it might have been mm -hmm. sounding like that's yeah. my guess yeah no but but it, it, it's definitely my, my point is uh, that whereas they sound prehistoric because they, they have this tribal approach. You certainly have, uh, uh, do this medieval, I believe more modern uh, folk music, but yeah, you're absolutely right that when it comes to any particularly ancient source in general, anybody just has to guess how it might have been uh, at the time. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Forbinded, your uh, upcoming album. As, as you mentioned, there are some of the songs that, or I don't know if all of the songs had actually been Recorded or at least started to be arranged in the past. I, I found some recordings of um, I think 2008 uh, live of Dagen Flir. Dagen, yeah. it's my favorite song of the new album. Uh, I, I had to find the. I did manage to track the the original uh, lyrics and kind of translate them into English to understand. I, I thought it was a fantastic song. Um, you did a Kickstarter back in 2018 for this album. How, how did the idea of Forbinded uh, 
start and what led you to, to kind of do the, the crowdsourcing uh, approach to it? The crowdfunding, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I, uh, since we had been putting the traditional material on the site uh, uh, when we were recording six, uh, we had uh, almost uh, all of these tunes. We knew that we wanted to work with these tunes, not everybody, but we had like maybe five of them we knew these ones are going to be used on the next album and Dog and Fleer was one of them. Uh, um, and uh, so we had like the, we knew that the, this will be more traditional uh, and more back to the roots of Garmana. Uh, and and uh, I think it was because we'd, we were talking about how to, how to fund uh, the project, how to, how to be able to start to record it before we knew who was going to release it. Uh, and uh, and uh, I'm, I'm playing with another project called the String Sisters mm -hmm. uh, that includes uh, fiddle players from the US, Ireland, Scotland, Norway and Sweden. And we did a Kickstarter campaign uh, for our album in 2018. So I think that was like uh, uh, what made Garmana think that we also we can also do this. Maybe we can also get people to kickstart us for a CD, mm -hmm. and uh, it worked. Uh, so it was for us. Uh, we did it to see if we could uh, fund the project before knowing who was going to release it. Uh, and uh, we we were very pleased to see that uh, so many people were willing to to help us and to pay for the material in, in on beforehand or uh, and i was <laughs> i was so uh, sure that we will not this will not work we will not get all the money so i <laughs> i said that if if we get all the money i will dance on stage <laughs> uh when we release the next album and uh, now i have to do that <laughs> well, but the good thing is that only 30 people will see you do it so it's yeah. not so bad oh, that's great <laughs> <laughs> so it's the, it's the, if you're gonna do something silly on stage it's the perfect time to do it very yeah. few people are watching um yeah. <laughs> and tell me a little bit about how for came to be in terms of the songs that you have uh selected were all of them already songs that you had worked um uh, or kind of rearranged already in the past. As I mentioned, Dag and Fleer is one of the songs that I've listened to, I think since 2008, it has been out or maybe sooner. Is it the case with all of them? Not with all of them, uh, but uh, Dag and Fleer, Avskedet. Oh my uh, God. I have no idea. I, I have no idea how, uh, thankfully that's not my favorite song because I would not have been able to say that one. But okay, so uh, there were a I couple. Would... Yeah, I said, I, I would say that maybe four or maybe four or maybe five. Now, four of them has been, we've been playing for a longer time. Uh, we've been, uh, and, and the rest uh, we found, for example, I, I'll show you. I've, there's a woman who made a very nice uh, book with. Oh, Scandinavian ballads. Yes. Uh, and there we found uh, like Sven i Rosengård and uh, the two sisters, two sisters, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, tradi traditional ballads that we've of course heard before mm -hmm. in different versions. But now we may we found them in this book and thought, okay, let's do them. And uh, we, um, it has been fun. I, I, this is what I like. I love to find old material, uh, traditional material, and uh, to give it new life and uh, make them, like ornament them with my singing. And that's like my, what I like to do. <laughs> so no, I'm very is, glad. It, it's really great. I think that well, coming from a person that, as, as, I, as it has become evident every time that I try to say a Swedish words, I don't speak Swedish, um, it is quite interesting to me to listen to you sing or to listen to Highland sing or to anybody who sings in a language that I completely ignore, because that allows me to think of their voices as an additional instrument, uh, as opposed to what happens when I'm listening to something in English or any language that I speak, because I, I can 
I can see that they're telling me something. Uh, and it's interesting because when I had to look up the lyrics of, for example, Dag and Clear, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to see whether the feelings that you're getting from listening to it actually have anything to do with what they're actually telling you, right? Uh, <laughs> I did, I completely missed the point of the song, but, it, but, it's, but it's interesting because it lets you analyze it from a, from a different perspective. Are there any favorites for you? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know what you're, uh, since I know that folk music is quite close to you and it is quite related to the manner in which you were brought up, I am certain that folk music has a deeper meaning for you emotionally that for, for other people. So are, are there any of these ballads that have been included in, in uh, Fort Grimm that, that are closer to your heart? Well, I like the two sisters very much uh, because uh, I like because it's like the the, the historical uh, thought of it because that is like an, an, an uh, uh, a story that must have been like number one, number one on the cinema. Mm -hmm. If there was if they were cinemas in the medieval times, which it wasn't, but uh, yeah, I mean. That was the story that was the most told story all over the world. Number one on the medieval ballad top list. <laughs> could, you, could you tell us a little bit about the story of the two sisters? Yeah, it's a story about two sisters who are in love with the same man. And one of them is uh, also his fiancée. Uh, uh, but the, the other sister who, who wants the man as well, she kills her sister to get the man. And uh, most often in most stories, she drowns her in uh, a lake or, uh, uh, well, in water. But there is an, um, a, a musician living at the seashore, or in our story here, it's two fishermen. And they, found, they find the body and they make an instrument of the body, uh, a harp. And they go to the wedding where the evil killer sister <laughs> is going to get married to the man and they play on this body harp and the harp is revealing the the secret of the murder uh, and uh, also uh, in most cases the bride falls dead on the floor of the music so it's the music the music of the dead woman's harp <laughs> is uh, revealing the story of what actually happened. Fascinating, I did not know that. And it's also a good story about the importance of uh, recycling. If you find somebody <laughs> outside of a lake, you can maybe make a good instrument out of it. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's especially now. Uh, Emma, I really want to thank you for having taken the time to speak with me today. It has been really interesting, it has been really fun, and I really look forward to the release of Forbunde just uh, four days from now uh, on Season of Mist. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a very good day. Take care of yourself. You too. Bye. -bye. Bye.